Um, I think um, uh, the more challenging question is in terms of how uh, um, scholars and how we as devotees approach the subject of religion. Uh, uh, scholars, academics, uh, historians, they see religion as a human product born from certain historical, social, cultural contexts, right? mm. uh, produced by human beings in a human society. And religious people all over the world, Vaishnavas, Christians, anyone, they see religion as being something that is consistent, comprehensive, and timeless. Okay? These three things are key, consistent, comprehensive, and timeless. Uh, what I mean to say by these three is that uh, first, starting with the last, timeless, that these are truths that are eternal. It's not like, you know, yesterday Krishna wasn't God until we all, he all emerged as a God in, in Hindu society. No, he's, God is God, right? So Krishna is always the Supreme Personality of God, if you take a simple example. Uh, but truths are timeless, um, uh, that uh, they are, uh, our, our, our religion, our faith, our tradition provides a comprehensive view of reality, right? So we don't say uh, Krishna consciousness explains or describes this, but uh, when it comes to um, Japan, Krishna consciousness is irrelevant. It has nothing to offer. Uh, or when it comes to uh, uh, Japan or China, we have nothing to say. It's only relevant for India. Okay. Or it's, it's, it, was, it was a perspective that works now, but it didn't work 50 years ago. Or it, is, um, it explains um, the nature of God, but we have nothing to say about the nature of this world. No, religion is comprehensive. It's a, okay. it's a total system for understanding life, existence, experience, knowledge, everything, right? Human beings, animals, plants, the moon, the stars, everything is explained. Yeah. It's timeless, it's comprehensive, and we insist on consistency. That what we are, that what Krishna says at the beginning of Bhagavad Gita is consistent with what he says at the end of the Gita, right? Now, there are different things he says. One, he says, you know, you should fight because it's your honor and all of that, your kshatriya. And then he says, give up all dharmas. So we don't say, oh, Krishna is contradicting himself. We can't take him seriously. No, we say these two things fit together. One is your swadharma, one is parodharma. So we find ways of explaining it in a consistent fashion. True. So this is not just devotees. This is any person, I should say any theistic person at least, is, is concerned with these three items. Okay. Religious studies, on the other hand, uh, academia is specifically focused on those truths that are relative, that are contingent, that are changing over time. So when, I'll give you an example, when the devotee studies the Upanishads, they are looking for those eternal truths that the sages have spoken for thousands of years and are relevant to us today in our own lives. Mm -hmm. When the scholar is looking at the Upanishads, they are seeing that this Upanishad is a product of North Indian rivalries between kingdoms in the sixth century BC. And you find elements of that rivalry clearly visible in the debate that happens in the court of Janaka between Yagnyavalki and the other pla uh, places. Yagnyavalki is from the East and the others are coming from the West. And there's certain political trajectory that is happening. Hmm. Now that question that I can guarantee no Acharya has brought up in their commentary. It is not a concern of ours, right? Whether there's political rivalries and when they're located in history geographically between different kingdoms. Okay, I shouldn't say never. Maybe someone has brought it up. But that is not our primary concern, right? Hmm. In fact, not only is it our, not our primary concern, but it can feel like a downright threat to our faith. Because we are now taking that which is eternal and comprehensive and consistent, and we are pointing out things that are temporal and limited, relative rather, and inconsistent or contradictory within it. In other words, we are taking that which is divine 
because that which is divine has these three characteristics, eternal, comprehensive, and time. And we are showing what is human within it. Because human beings are not consistent, they're not timeless, and they're not comprehensive. We're very limited and very, very relative and very temporary. So they're looking at the same object from different perspectives altogether. And this is the fundamental issue that causes religious people to see intellectual scholars with some measure of distaste, some measure of fear, and some measure of rejection. And this is what gets some scholars to see religion as religious people as being rather naive, mm. otherworldly. So this is the, the conflict set up between the two. And I have some suggestions, some reasons for why it doesn't necessarily have to be a conflict, that in fact, they can be quite useful to each other. 